Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. The North Dakota Humanities Council, a nonprofit, independent state partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. The North Dakota Council on the Arts. And by the members of Prairie Public. Hi, I'm Bob Danback, and welcome to Prairie Mosaic, a patchwork of stories about the people and places that contribute to the arts, culture, and history in our region. On this edition, we'll head up north to visit a resourceful community and to see how snowmobiles are made. We'll ask the question, do people want to eat food grown by people they know? And we'll drop in on a concert that encourages students to learn about and appreciate symphonic music. The Kensington runestone was discovered in western Minnesota in the late 1800s by Swedish immigrant and farmer Olaf Omen. It has long been a topic of controversy. Was it carved by Omen himself, or is it an authentic carved rock that was left by Scandinavian explorers in the 1400s? Hoax or a piece of history? You be the judge. I came to the conclusion that it was a fake. And I would maintain that he definitely has an agenda and an axe to grind against this uh, artifact. The Runestone Museum was constructed in 1958, and it was founded uh, primarily to house the Kensington Runestone. The stone was found by a farmer, Olaf Omen and his sons, while clearing ground on their farm near Kensington, Minnesota in 1898. Uh, it was entwined in the roots of an aspen tree, and once they pulled it up, they found uh, some writing on it, some lettering on it, and soon found out that it was runic writing and that's what kind of started the mystery of the runestone. We have researchers that are adamant about its authenticity and then those that question the authenticity. The first phase was to conduct sort of an overall forensic evaluation and, and, and we did that and we were able to uh, document several interesting things. And then there was a second phase that happened a couple years later where I conducted a tombstone study where I looked at the weathering of uh, tombstones in uh, Maine and uh, that had similar mineralogy and a comparable weathering environment, which of course, uh, uh, I think a, a cemetery is about as close as you're ever gonna come to the environment that the stone was in. and. Um, what I did was try to document how long it took for certain minerals that had already weathered away on the runestone, and I concluded that process took about 200 years uh, when they started to come off the surface, and since they were already gone on the runestone, I concluded that the weathering must be older uh, than 200 years, and that's from 1898 when the stone was pulled out of the ground. The, the conservative estimate is that the weathering of the inscription puts it um, no sooner than the, the late uh, 1600s. I don't believe it because when we look at the claims that Walter makes, we're not talking about the age of the stone, we're talking about the age of the actual grooves that form the runes. They were chipped out and Walter is claiming that those rune grooves are very old. Now in order to show that, he looked at those rune grooves and they all looked fresh. Well, the claim is that the rune grooves were all cleaned out after the rune stone was discovered because they had dirt in them. So they were scraped out and all the rune grooves were freshened. So the rune grooves aren't old. They look fresh, except for some tiny chips on the surfaces of the grooves that look weathered. First of all, you're admitting that the rune grooves don't look old. Second, 
The fact that the surfaces of the rune grooves might look old simply says that you know, th those small chips off the surface of the rune grooves, or I should say off the upper portion of the rune grooves, may simply be the weathered cortex of the rock. Well, I think the preponderance of evidence is consistent with it being here, uh, being carved in the 14th century, and since the rock is indigenous to Minnesota, which was one of the conclusions we reached from the geologic work, um, somebody came here that had that knowledge, presumably from somewhere in Europe, and carved the stone, and I believe immediately buried it uh, as a land claim. Well, I think the author of the inscription was most likely a Cistercian monk. There are a number of reasons why we think that. Um, and uh, we also speculate that um, in the middle of the 14th century, which was not long after uh, the medieval order of Knights Templar were put down, who are uh, essentially one and the same ideologically with the Cistercians, who founded them officially in 1128. What happened to them? I believe that they came over here. And uh, I think the Kensington runestone is uh, one of the documents that they left. The idea that the Templars or Cistercians were in America, I, 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 I have no idea where this, where this evidence comes from. I, I've, I've, I've seen and read about what he says. I, I just find it in, unbelievable. And so, as far as a route that they could have taken, one is uh, one that's been put forth by many people, which is the Hudson Bay, Nelson River, Lake Winnipeg, Red River route, which, which will put you uh, in the Kensington area. The other is the Great Lakes route, which personally, just because I like it better, um, I think they may have followed that route. The Kensington runestone comes from the middle of the continent, from the middle of Minnesota. It's literally hundreds of miles from any major uh, lake or waterway, like let's say Hudson Bay or even Lake Superior. Because you would expect that Norse explorers would have come to, if they, when they came to America, would have first come to the coastal areas and settled there or explored there. When we look for the explanation, what do we get? We get coincidence, coincidence piled on coincidence all sorts of circumstances that are unlikely. For example, here's a runic inscription that's found by a, by a farmer in 1898. The farmer, it turns out, is Swedish. He's an immigrant uh, to America from Sweden. Uh, he has in his possession, after the rune stone is found, books and newspaper clippings with runic writing in them. I would have no problem saying I was wrong, this is a Viking site, and I mean, it, there, would, there would be funding, there would be an excitement, uh, I, I'd be famous. People are certainly entitled to their opinions, and, um, but unfortunately, they haven't put forth any evidence to support that, and, and you know, doing forensic work and analyzing logic problems is what I do for a living all day, every day. And uh, the fact is, is that um, there are many facts from multiple disciplines, including geology, which is a hard science discipline, that are consistent with this being a medieval artifact. We just feel that the stone is available to any serious researcher, and um, we more or less take a neutral position on, on the is it authentic or is it not? Well, it's just the best kept secret in Minnesota, so go out and tell all of your friends and neighbors to stop in and see us. Roseau, Minnesota is the home of Polaris and the sport of snowmobiling. The 1954 birth of Polaris was the result of the dreams and aspirations of three exceptional men and the ingenuity of a small community. Today, Polaris remains a leader in the industry. As we tour the Polaris plant, we see that for employees, making snowmobiles is not just a job, it's a way of life. The company was started in 1945. Edgar Team, David Johnson, had this idea to build hoists and derricks. 
a device used to set telephone poles. In 1948, Alan Hattin, Edgar's brother, joined them, and they did a lot of blacksmith work, doing whatever they could to keep cash flow and keep the bankers away from the door. The company remained at Teen Hoist and Derrick until 1954 when it was incorporated as Polaris Industries. Polaris started in snowmobiles in 1956. From there on, things began to accelerate with snowmobiles and the march was on for Polaris to bring snowmobiles into the future. In the early days, most of the employees were farmers. So they farmed in the spring, putting their crops in, then they would work at Polaris until harvest time. And as Polaris grew, the women started transitioning into the assembly types of jobs. We'll even have three generations of a family working here at, at a, one given time. The Wide Track LX is meant to be for utility type purposes. The primary use of that vehicle is for work. They'll pull sleighs of firewood or other equipment. The wide track on it gives it very good flotation and excellent towing capacity. That's what we will see being built today. Uh, this is our tube fabrication area. We're bending and cutting the tubes to the sizes we need for our various components, putting in mounting features, locating features that help to locate the parts in the weld fixture. So we're taking just long straight lengths of tubing and turning them into the individual components that we need to build our products. We also do laser cutting. That's where we will cut features into the tubes and cutting them to lengths and various shapes. This laser is very quickly cutting these oval holes, the round holes, the shape of this tube on the end. As we move them into the next step of the process, they fit together in the fixtures and mate with the parts that they go along with. For the snowmobiles, we do very little welding. At this point, really all we weld is the, the bulkhead and then the cooling extrusions. We have a combination of robotic and manual welding going on. The finished parts coming out of the robot that feeds into the next level assembly. An operator then takes that part and completes some welds that the robot's not able to get to. The paint system is an e-coat and powder top coat type of system. It's very environmentally friendly. This is the powder coating process, and so the material is just very much a, a chalky substance, uh, powder, as is the name implies, electrostatically bonded to the part, and then it goes through the oven where it heats the, the paint material and flows it and cures it onto the component that it's been painted onto. We start out with the chassis where we join the engine compartment with the tunnel, the tunnel being the area that houses the suspension under it and the seat and the passenger on the top side of it. As it progressed down the line, we put in the cooling system, this, uh, the rear suspension and track assembly, and then the engine, and we move on into the seat and the hood, and you have a, a completed vehicle. We went through the run-up area, where they run the vehicle and run it through a series of diagnostics, making sure that all the lighting, the instrumentation works, that the vehicle goes in forward and reverse, low gear and high gear in the forward direction then into the crate. They put it into a shrink bag, which in, once the vehicle is fastened into the crate, the top half of the bag is put in place and zippered shut. And then we literally shrink the bag around the vehicle to protect it from the elements while it's in storage and in shipment to the dealers. We're a pretty tight-knit group, and, and everybody works very hard to, to help Polaris be successful. When I go through the plant, it's hard for me not to say hi to them and them to say hi to me. That's how we are on a, a normal basis. There are times when things get pretty hectic in, in the work area and here at Polaris, and everybody just really, really takes a lot of pride in helping to make Polaris successful. They work very hard to do that. They're family away from home. Do people want to eat food grown by people they know? What is a CSA? We'll explore those questions and more in a segment entitled Entrepreneurial Spirit from the Prairie Public 
North Dakota Humanities Council project, Key Ingredients. There's a hunger on the part of consumers for food that's produced by folks they know. It also tells me that there is a social desire for consumers to get together with these producers because one of the cool things about farmers markets is not just about going and buying food. It's about talking to the producer about how the food was raised. It's about uh, celebrating life and it's about socializing. And it was eye-opening to me as a commissioner to see these sorts of things unfold even in very small towns across North Dakota. I mean, we had maybe four or five years before I uh, was no longer Ag Commissioner, we maybe had 10 or 12 farmers markets around the state. In just a period of four or five years, that number moved up to well over 50, close to 60 farmers markets that were established with regular places of doing business, regular hours. That's rapid growth. Three and a quarter of carrots and a lot of young people who want to go into farming now and are going into farming all across the country are very smart, they're not afraid of complexity, and the important thing is that they're really not interested in raising corn and soybeans, they want to raise food for people. So you could begin to see some changes in communities where you have more community people working together to produce more of their own food from their own resources and that food will be obviously local and then people will know where it comes from. And you could see a whole new, different kind of community culture evolve out of that. I left the Bismarck Mandan area around the age of 20 and I left with a love for farming because I worked here on my uncle's farm and I met a man who happened to be a farmer as well and have a love for farming and we decided to start a family. She had this idea, hey, there's this family land and it's not really being used by the family right now. Maybe we could lease it and so here we are. I was hoping there might be some strawberries. You know what, there's only a million billion. <laughs> Do you want a bag? CSAs are really wonderful and in my opinion they are the perfect marriage between consumers and farmers. But here's oh, some pimentos. I, I took your advice last time and like you said just eat them raw. Yeah. They are. It's like candy. Isn't it's it so amazing? Yeah. CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture. Here at Riverbound Farm our CSA members get to come out to the farm once a week for 17 weeks which is as long as our summer season was mid-June through mid-October and pick up whatever they want that's available for that week. And they can also do pick your own things. And one of the great things about CSAs is share the bounty, share the risk. As soon as we got here, there was like a whole group of people who were like, hey, we're so glad you're here. You know, we've been waiting for this. And so um, that's been nice. <laughs> and that, I mean, that's why North Dakota is a good place, I guess, for us. Um, also, North Dakota is an agricultural state, and there's a lot of people here who grew up on farms and now live in some sort of urban or suburban setting, and so are sort of separated from that, and they crave it. A small farmer who's marketing their goods through a CSA helps ensure themselves a customer base for the entire season. And as a consumer, you're ensuring yourself local, fresh, high quality food raised right here in your community by your neighbor. You're keeping your money in the community and you're ensuring your neighbor a good living. You can go out to the farm, you can shake hands with the farmer and you can be a part of that. And that's something that we are really trying to develop here at Riverbound Farm. We are inviting our members to be a part of the farm. Yeah. North Dakota has a rural heritage. It's a rural state and there's a lot of farmers. And North Dakota farmers are doing a great job feeding the entire world. And it's something that we should really be proud of. Something that I think is out of balance is the small farmers in our communities. We can also do a really great job feeding ourselves and having our 
members of our state have access to farms again and get reacquainted with our food and where it comes from and feed ourselves again. The Fargo-Moorhead Symphony Orchestra performs a young people's concert each year at Concordia College in Moorhead. This concert encourages students to learn about and appreciate symphonic music by listening to some popular yet classic compositions. Orchestras play much classical music, but they also do other types of music. And one way that maybe you've heard orchestras is when you hear a movie, they play the, the music that goes behind that. We call it a film track or a soundtrack or a film score. And so today we're going to play two movements of a wonderful movie theme, and I think you're going to recognize it when you hear it. Now, in this piece, you're going to hear some of the violins play the melody as well, and other instruments are going to be adding rhythm. So we hope you enjoy this little dance of Tchaikovsky, Dance of the Swan. Thank you. 
Thank you for joining us for this edition of Prairie Mosaic. If you know of an artist, a topic, or an organization in our region that you think might make an interesting segment, please contact us at prairiemosaic at prairiepublic.org. For Prairie Mosaic, I'm Bob Dambach. Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. The North Dakota Humanities Council, a nonprofit, independent state partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. The North Dakota Council on the Arts. And by the members of Prairie Public.